So what we're going to do now is we're going to begin focusing on C++ containers. And I'll start by giving you sort of the context in which the containers occur, uh, and also briefly touch on the other elements that we'll cover in more detail later, such as iterators and algorithms, because these three concepts really work very closely together. Uh, they're not isolated from each other, but we can talk about them relatively independently. So here's kind of a pictorial view of the three key elements. So the first thing we're going to focus on, which we'll begin today, is the concept of a container, which is basically an abstract data type. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And there's several different categories of containers. There's sequential containers, there's associative containers, and there are adapters. And I'll talk more about what those things are. The easiest way to think about what a container is, it's a, it's a way to hold elements and have iterators that can be used to access the elements in the container. So it's basically a collection of elements, if you will. The next topic we're gonna to talk about, not exclusively today, but we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon it because you, it's very hard to talk about these things completely in isolation, is the concept of an iterator. And we'll see that iterators are used to provide structured access to the elements in containers. And there are five categories of iterators in C++ STL. There's input iterators, output iterators, forward iterators, bidirectional iterators, and random access iterators. And they are important to understand in that order. And we'll talk about those probably, um, probably get to that actually starting next week. Each container declares a trait which indicates the type of iterator category that it supports. And we'll talk a lot more about traits. Traits are basically implemented typically as type defs of local classes that have particular properties associated with them. And they're very cool. And they also support the concept of generic programming. And then the, the final topic here that we're gonna cover in great detail is generic algorithms. And we'll see that there's several different categories of those. There's mutating algorithms that change the contents of containers. There's non-mutating algorithms that just kind of read the contents of containers. There's ways to sort containers. There's ways to have numeric operations that uh, work on elements of containers, and so on and so forth. And the, the other piece of the puzzle here is how containers and algorithms coordinate. And the way they coordinate is through iterators. So each container has a way to get iterators to its contents in some structured way either from beginning to end or end to the beginning or in some random access order. And the algorithms that work on the elements of containers always do so through iterators. And you'll see how that works. And then the other thing I show up here, which is kind of a cross between a container and an algorithm, is the concept of a functor. And those are basically function objects that have the implementation of the function call method, and they're used to guide the algorithms. There also can be used to customize certain properties of containers as well. And we'll see those examples too. Okay, so that's a big picture view. And now we're gonna start diving down into containers. So what is a container? So a container is essentially an instance or a variant of a so-called abstract data type. Now I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you learned about abstract data types in CS201 or whatever equivalent you might've taken in our data structures course. Uh, I also keep my fingers crossed you remember what an abstract data type was, but in case you need a little bit of a refresher, an abstract data type is simply a, an abstraction that contains a set of values or elements and a set of cohesive operations on these values. And as you can see, STL defines a whole bunch of these, and it also breaks them up into different categories. So we have so-called sequential containers, and those include things like vector deck and list. We have so-called associative containers, which include sets, multi-sets, maps, and multi-maps. And then we have so-called adapted containers or derived containers. And these are stacks, queues, and priority queues. And we'll talk a lot more about this stuff, so I'm not gonna dwell on them right at the moment. All containers in STL are parameterized by the types that they contain. So if you're familiar with Java, you probably know that Java has something called collections, which are basically abstract data types that are parameterized by the types they contain. And STL containers are very similar in concept to Java collections, although the implementations are quite different. 
Uh, in particular, the Java collections use inheritance and dynamic binding very heavily in order to get the extensibility that they provide, whereas STL containers use generic programming, parameterized types, and non-virtual methods in order to be able to get the performance and the extensibility that they provide. And there's kind of trade-offs, so we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through this. If you're familiar with Java collections, I think you'll marvel at the incredible power of STL containers because they, they do lots of things that Java collections really can't do very well. Um, most notably, or one of the notable things with the STL containers, you can instantiate them with primitive types like int and double and long and so on, whereas you really can't do that with the Java collections. You have to wrap up things into um, integer as opposed to int and so on. So we've already seen examples of this earlier. Example would be our stack class. That's a good example of, of a STL container and it's parameterized by type T and also by the type of container too, for that matter, that's used to implement the stack. Each container contains various traits. And you can see here, here's a bunch of the different traits that are defined for containers. You get iterator, you get const iterator, you get value type, and then a whole bunch of other things that are kind of used internally like difference type and uh, size type and pointer and all this good stuff. You, you don't have to know all of these things, but it's really important at least to understand things like iterator and const iterator and perhaps value type for some situations. Iterator and const iterator are the most common traits that are associated with the containers that we're likely to use. Now, the funny part is when, when STL first came out, you really had to understand the concept of a trait uh, because you'd have to use you know, vector, blah, blah, colon, colon, iterator. Nowadays, when we have the auto keyword, we can let the compiler deduce the type of the iterator. And so oftentimes you don't have to use the iterator traits nearly as much from a programming point of view. Of course, the implementations under the hood of these containers use them all over the place. But you as an end user are now often able to get around having to remember the types. Each container provides factory methods for creating various types of iterators. And typically the, the factory methods are begin and end, which give us so-called iterators that can go from front to back of the collection. And then there's also R begin and R end, which are used to traverse from back to front. And then in addition to these methods, there's also methods that are used to create const iterators. So there's both non-const iterators and const iterators. And the methods have the same names, begin end and R begin and R end. But depending on the context in which things are used, either the const version or the non-const version will be used. And uh, I use a picture of Bob the Builder here uh, as an example of someone who builds something. So it's a factory method for creating iterators. There are several types of STL containers. Sequential containers are used to arrange the data they contain in a so-called linear manner. And linear, think when you think of linear, sort of think of left to right. The element order in a sequential container, you know, if you have vector sub zero, vector sub one, vector sub two, and so on, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the actual values. Excuse me. Um, so the values of the elements in sequential containers have nothing to do with their order. Instead, it's typically the order in which they're inserted into the container, the encounter order, the insertion order. And in some cases, if you start removing elements in the container, then the order will shift a bit. Um, and of course, you can sort the elements in the container as well, which will definitely change their order unless they're already sorted. But in the, as a general rule, the values are not what dictate the order that they go into the container. It's the order in which they're put in the container in the first place. Certain of these containers, especially vector, are quite similar to C-style built-in arrays, which we've looked at a number of times in the course. However, a couple things. First of all, sequential containers are way cooler than built-in arrays, as for reasons we'll learn about in a second. And secondly, you don't actually have to store the values uh, in a contiguous manner. Vector does, in fact, store the values in a contiguous manner, in one chunk. But other sequential containers like deck and list and forward list 
do not store the elements in contiguous order. Instead, it chops them up and links them together. So you can see here, here are the four sequential containers, and they I basically briefly summarize their characteristics. So vector gives you linear and contiguous storage, much like a, a built-in array. In fact, it's actually implemented under the hood as a dynamically allocated array. And it allows fast insertions and removals only at the end. So vector is really good if you want to put things at the end and remove things from the end. If you want to remove things from the middle or the beginning, vector may not be the, the quick container for you. There's also another container called list, which is a doubly linked list that allows for fast insertions and removals anywhere in the list. Um, so if you remember, if you've taken the data structures course where you had to do some linked list work, which you probably did, then you remember how linked lists work. And a doubly linked list is just an implementation of a linked list that allows you to be able to go either front to back or back to front and insert elements very quickly anywhere in the list without having to worry about starting at one point and traversing to where you need to go. The problem with, well, the, the, the consequence of using a, a list is it's doubly linked. So you have to have an extra pointer. And if you're never gonna go backwards, then that extra pointer might be overkill. So to make things a bit more space conserving, there's also something called a forward list. And that's a singly linked list that allows fast insertions and removals anywhere in the list, but it only has one pointer. So you can only go forwards, not backwards. And then the fourth type of sequential container is called the deck. And that allows linear, but not necessarily contiguous storage that allows fast insertions and removals at either the front or at the back. So deck stands for double ended queue, and that gives you more flexibility if you have algorithms that need to do things at the front as well as at the back. Okay, so those are the so-called sequential containers. There's also a set of containers called ordered associative containers. Now, the concept here is associative container, and then we'll talk about the ordering aspect second. So an associative container supports efficient operations on elements using its keys. And so what you're doing is you're associating the key with something. Now, in some cases, you just have a key. The sets, for example, just have keys. In other cases, you have a key that also is associated with a value. And those are what are called maps. So ordered associative containers are implemented as balanced binary trees using a red black tree implementation, which is a very popular balanced binary tree. Hopefully you learned about balanced binary trees in your data structures course. And these are ordered by operator less than. So the tree is basically ordered as a balanced binary tree using operator less than. So every key is expected to implement operator less than. Now remember the key property of a balanced binary tree is that all operations like insert, remove, and find will never take more than log n time, where n is the number of nodes in the tree. And by balancing the tree, it means that you never have to traverse more than log n levels or depth into the tree to find, remove, or insert an element. All right, so that's what an ordered associative container is. It's storing things in order. There are four ordered associative containers. There's something called a set, which has only a key, and it does not allow duplicate keys. There's also something called a multi-set, which has only keys, but can have duplicates. And then there's something called a map, which has a key value pair, and that is going to have no support for duplicates. Every key must be unique. And then finally, we'll have something called a multi-map, which has the ability to have duplicate keys that are associated with values. So those are the four primary types of associative containers. Just as we're going along, I want to mention a few things. Vector is a very, very common sequential container. A lot of people use vector. Map is a very, very common ordered associative container. It's also got some really cool properties that we'll take a look at when we get into the code part of the discussion. With later versions of C++, they then added some so-called unordered associative containers. These also have the ability to allow associations either for keys or for key value pairs, but they have the property that they're not ordered using an ordered binary tree. Instead, they're implemented as, you guessed it, hash functions. 
So again, hopefully you learned hashing in your data structures course. And if you recall what hashing is, is it takes a key and it creates a pseudo random number, it doesn't create a random number, it creates a pseudo random number that can be used to index into an array. And in that array will typically be either linked lists or binary trees that are used when two values hash to the same location. And the, the list or tree that falls from that is used for doing what's called collision resolution. And we typically just store things in a list or a tree. Uh, the STL implementation uses a list. The, the Java implementation of this, which is called a hash map or a concurrent hash map, uses a very cool adaptive data structure that starts out with a list. And then if the lists start getting long, it switches over to balanced binary trees, which is pretty cool. I honestly don't know why they don't do that with STL. That, that model is cool because it means that you never have to worry about worst case time when using the unordered mechanisms. At any rate, the way it works is you have these hash functions that will hash you to a location. And then there's another function that's used to do a quality checking to see where the item goes into the linked list at that point. There are four unordered associative containers, and they just mimic the ordered associative containers. So we have unordered set, unordered multi-set, unordered map, and unordered multi-map. And so these have all the same properties that the regular ordered ones do, except they're not ordered. They're unordered. They're using hashing. And the reason why we call hashing unordered is just that there's no particular rhyme or reason to where things go in the table. It's up to the hash function to try to distribute them as, as uh, randomly, using that word in quotes, as possible. Uh, by the way, a good quiz question would be, why can a hash function not be random? <laughs> and the answer is because you'd never have a way of getting the result back in any deterministic manner. So it's pseudo-random. The fourth category of container in STL are called adapted containers. And what they do is they take existing containers like decks and vectors or lists and so on, and then they adapt them to have a more familiar interface that's restricted. So things like stack is an example of adapted container. A queue is an example of an adapted container. A priority queue is another example of an adapted container. Stacks and queues default to using decks, and a priority queue defaults to using a vector. And we'll talk more about those things as we get into the details of, of STL. This is the end of the overview of STL containers. And we will then start in the next video talking about the vector container.